Welcome to the 17th in the series of uh, this dialogue 2047. It's, um, uh, it's what we've called conversations on nation building, really looking at what India can be at 100, 2047, when we will be uh, 100 years old as an independent country, where we want to be, how we can be where we want to be. In this scenario, we have the farmer collective. The FPO that is put now in popularly their programs also the farmer collective and the role of the farmer collective in both looking at the ecological health of the resources as well as the livelihood security and job security, income security, I would say job security, income security of the farming community itself. So uh, you know what does the FPO do to the small and marginal farming community, which is such a huge number? Uh, what kind of potential? I mean the first uh, really farming community cooperative in that sense was a whole. What uh, we feel is um, when community institutions are, uh, the FPO to my mind is an externally imposed model as of now. It is because someone else felt that collective action is good and so there was a whole a planning system put in place where uh, FPOs were required to be set up. Uh, whether many times, I mean, from the 2000 plus FPOs that have 2700, I think, uh, FPOs that are currently up and running, uh, up of course, running, I don't know, uh, is how how many of these came from the need felt by the community? How many of these still feel connected? to the FPO and still feel that the FPO has has given them something that other market systems did not. Because ultimately the F, uh, FPO is is in a way uh, re, uh, re, uh, rearranging the uh, power system, power equations at the uh, village or the community level. Now whether these power equations have been just replaced or they have uh, replaced, meaning the middlemen, traders, etc. An FPO has taken the position of that, or has it really benefited the community? Uh, these are questions that will only be answered in the long term. We are we are born in a very blessed country, except your edible oil, parts of edible oil, and part of pulses. We have been managed to produce all our requirement till now. Edible oil is a huge back, uh, drawback area that that I am not touching. Up. But otherwise, our farmers have been producing most of our needs. And FPOs, now FPOs, farmers call it to be called, they have played a really huge role in that because, because, because farmers have found that growing horticulture crop is obviously resulting in more income. I am not saying that the entire value chain is quite a decent. So, in the process, we have learned a lot. So, what happened was in 2010, when we first started the uh, formal farmers, farmers producers organization program, we did not have any funding from the government of India. We did it with our own funds because everything cost money. So even in the case of Nabal, we had to raise money from the market and then do it because we didn't have any funding. And when you raise funds from the uh, market, it has a cost. Nevertheless, we did create a small fund called the uh, uh, Producers Compensation Development Fund, PODF, and then it took just a small fund of 50 crores and started off. But then it got on so well, and how we again depended only on the NGOs. Because we knew the other people who know how to bring people together, bring farmers together. We did not want anybody else to get to the picture then, because it was a pilot stage. And over a period of uh, two to three years, the journey was quite uh, interesting and quite supportive. But the government of India saw that there seemed to be a lot of potential in the system of uh, bringing about uh, farmers' collectives. And in 2014, the government gave 200 crores to Nabar to promote 2,000 farmers clubs, sorry, farmer producers organizations over a period of two years. The two year period is over and we have completed that. An important point that you brought up is the case of Abul, yeah? uh, which is used ad nauseum in uh, some of these cases. 
uh, where, wherever we have such public discussions. And uh, what we fail to also see is that there are certain great negative sides to a movement, which are never brought in the form. Some of them, even being today, is the political management surrounding their board and how things run. You know, all you need to do is turn the pages of newspapers and see how the elections happen, and you'll find that there is a lot of uh, negative energy built into this system already. And the second thing is that uh, it's because of the policies of Amul to a great degree that I've seen because I'm working with dairy farmers also in Gujarat area, is the reduction in the overall number of indigenous breeds of cattle in the country, all thanks to actually the policies of Amul. Yeah? And also the third fact that there is really little or no scope in Amul for uh, production of safe milk. I don't want to use the term organic, but I think that there are uh, uh, great many negative sides to this which we sometimes forego. Now, this is just a point I wanted to make. So, Sudeep, I really had a request. Could you just give a citation on where did you find out about the uh, the uh, stat on uh, horticulture production outstripping agriculture? I'd really be interested in finding the uh, citation. But uh, to your point on this role of Mondays, you know, we as part of our collective, we've interacted with Mondays as well as running our own supply chain now to understand the price conundrum is that uh, uh, who decides the price of a potato and why? Amul is not the shining star um, but Amul is in that sense uh, an inspiration for a lot of FPOs from where they stand. So to that extent you know promoting their aspirations to say one day you can be an Amul if you do these things is one way to get them uh, motivated towards that goal. Um, I totally agree with you regarding the safe milk and the promotion of uh, 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 hybrid cows or whatever. Uh, there are now demonstrated uh, cis, uh, milk cooperatives in place uh, who are uh, getting back to looking at how do they have a milk chain that is focused on the AC breed because it is a hardy breed and reaches uh, milk which is non-pasteurized, just chilled to the doorstep of urban consumers. See, look at, if we look at our milk production, about 160 million tons of last year. Uh, we have marketable surplus is about 40 or 49 percent. The rest of all is kept as farmers for his own consumption. And out of that 50, 40 or 50 percent, the cooperatives and all only control about 30 to 40 percent. There is a huge market. It's not that Amul has destroyed everything, but Amul is needed and Amul has, although we can go back to the debate of, because I am part of the Valgis Kunya Center of Excellence, Valgis Kunya never wanted that Amul should compete with Mother Dairy or Amul should compete with. But that was his thought 30 years back. Then. Here's the survival of the fetus. Nobody, nobody has stopped a corporate from Orissa or from, uh, from Bihar, uh, is for me, or Nandiri to come to Delhi or to supply. And today you must look at, before uh, before criticizing Amul model, perhaps you're forwarding everyone here who consume Amul milk. Sorry, I'm not a spokesperson of Amul at all. I'm just giving you data with you because they are the biggest supplier. If you look at the packet of Amul we supply, there is it's sourced from a place called Banaskanta, the district. Uh, and this is a 25% of the Amul story. I just recently been to. Uh, and staggering 2.5 lakh farmers in a district, all are dairy farmers. Small little dairy farmers. And the, the turnover that one dairy, Banaskanta dairy, which is, is 1 billion, 6,000 crore rupees turnover. So that look at the impact of dairy on the, on the large scale. Detail you can read in many of my stories are there. So look at the impact. It's not that Amul has. It, is it, there are many Nandinis, Karnataka. There are a lot of small dairies coming up. There are private dairies coming up. So this space is huge. Still, still, I 30, 40 percent of market is controlled by Arun Bala. Till now, if you look at the entire country in terms of not in big cities. So that's why blaming Amul is unfair in this particular. And quality aspect, we can debate about that, that, that I am not an expert or not. But having said so, again that part grading comes in. If you look at applied to milk, as he said, the, the expensive milk, there is something called happy cows in Maharashtra. This company happy cows, they keep their cows happy. 
Apparently, the 300 rupees ticket, and uh, and also look at look at the the Rahul and Madhuri also responded to the market change. Basically. I also agree with the point that uh, uh, recently they launched the cow milk. And then take out the price. What is the way? The poor farmer doesn't know what what, what is the price that he is going to get. This is where the digitalized uh, uh, mechanism could help. I think it's a long way off, but nevertheless it can. Then about uh, tracking measures, which ma'am was, uh, I've been trying to avoid that question right at the beginning, but I think I can't avoid it now. Now, unfortunately, I think it's too early to track at this stage. Because, see, when you talk of far farming, or when you talk of a change, anybody resists a change. You, I, the farmer, everybody. You may say, you may say nay, nay, I'm so nay, nay, and all that. But uh, the fact of the matter is, uh, when a change is uh, posed in front of you, you would like to change, uh, resist it. You may think about it and then change, that's a different issue. With the result, in Jharkhand, when we first tried out the question of uh, interaction of SRI, that is the system of root interest irrigation in Bali, which is supposed to be at that time, I'm talking about 2010. We tried to introduce it for the first time in Jharkhand with the help of again uh, Pradhan because they were the people who knew the PhD farmers. And about another 50 odd uh, NGOs who knew something about it, who were trained later on, and then we got to it. But most of the farmers in Jharkhand, they grow only traditional rice. And we made it sure that they did not change their rice variety for the first one or two years. Why the mandi, as in there is no, uh, as in the farmer or the producer who spent at least five to six months with the uh, uh, crop uh, has no control on the mandi as when you reach there, whether you are doing pechal, which is almost like everybody's growing potato in this part of uh, the country. Uh, if you avoid that, uh, uh, there is no uh, price fix which you can get on your producers. The essence of any of these models is the collectivization uh, and that collectivization because of its very nature uh, brings scale and brings better bargaining power, better uh, incomes down to the growers. But in the format, in the legal formats of these institutions, when you look at, yes, the cooperative act probably started out with the same principles but along the way got very corrupt. And the, the current situation as far as cooperatives is concerned, I don't think it's a dead end, more or less. What you do is that 26 kg is not good quality. This 4 kg is not good quality. So, obviously, the farmers who have 30 kg of tomato, 30 quintals of tomato, so what 4 quintals are you going to do? Because he or she cannot keep that 40 quintals of tomato. He will sort of hang on the head. So, that's why the first thing was the 18 CDs in the first semester. I said replacing Monday will take a lot of time unless the government buys land and invites private sector. Because this is a very tricky thing. Every state is trying to deploy it. Maharashtra is trying to deploy it. Karnataka is trying to progress. Hoga. But again, the big point is very small commodities. Karnataka has done pulses, uh, sorry, pulses, sorry, uh, sweet. But very small commodities are the biggest challenge. You know? And every commodity. Uh, is a unique story. Tomato ka alag, rice, rice, rice. onion is different, thing. potato is different, thing. but potato onion has been stabilized. I must tell you, these two commodities have taken over. Two rupees a kg this season. Yeah, but 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 our, our supply system has been uh, has been has been quite efficient in that term. But the production, the agricultural commodity goes to fluctuation. So there is no doubt about that. I think there is a point that if you would also like to do, it came up when the shukri you were making and this whole business of the duty. So, are there are there positives in certain models of registration of the FPO? And you know, you you mentioned about the cooperatives being, you know, being interfered in, and the max not being interfered in, and the and then of course there's you know companies act in section 25, section 8, or people just go and register them in cities and federations, and people really don't know. So, are there pros and cons of the institutional model that can uh, you know, 
um, yes, there are pros and cons. Um, the essence of any of these models is the collectivization. Uh, and that collectivization, because of its very nature, uh, brings scale and brings better bargaining power, better uh, incomes down to the growers. But in the format, in the legal formats of these institutions, when you look at, yes, the cooperative act probably started out with the same principles, but along the way got very corrupt. And the, the current situation, as far as the cooperatives is concerned, I don't think it's a dead end, more or less. Uh, the FPO being uh, the FPC being introduced as uh, as part of the uh, ROC registrar of companies under a special section uh, is to basically break uh, that uh, that end we had reached as far as uh, the cooperatives in terms of interference, manipulation, etc. 